as athletes, as coaches, and as sports science enthusiasts, we're all just looking for a way to make each repetition as high quality as possible. So we want repetitions that are fast. We want reps that don't change hugely throughout the course of a set. And we want reps that are going to give us the maximum amount of adaptation possible. When we're looking to the literature for things that are going to improve the quality of reps, cluster training is something that often comes up. And that's what we're dealing with in today's paper review. So today's paper comes from a collaboration between Spanish and Brazil universities. Uh, the title of the paper is Mechanical, Metabolic and Perceptual Acute Responses to Different Set Configurations in the Full Squat. So just a quick overview of the methods and then we'll get into the discussion of the results like we always do. So we had 11 strength trained men. So these were sports science students, approximately 80 kilos body weight. They were um, early 20s. Um, now, strength trained means what it means, I suppose. So we had 11 of these. We had the full squat in a Smith machine, so they kept the depth and everything uh, consistent. Sets and reps were, you know, variables are minimized essentially. Humidity, all that was kept uh, similar. So they had four different cluster protocols and two different traditional protocols. Okay, so they had the traditional one was three by ten with uh, no rest between reps. Okay. So we had traditional two, which was six by five, and that had no rest between reps either. So they just went through the reps as fast as they could, essentially, or with normal pacing. So then we had four different cluster sets or variables. So that we had CL1, which is cluster one, which was three by 10. Between each rep, we had 10 seconds rest, okay? So with CL2, we had three by 10, 15 seconds between each rep. With CL3, which is three by 10, we had 30 seconds rest between each rep. And then finally, we had CL4, which was one by 30 and we had 15 seconds rest between each rep. So the loading used for all of these sets and reps was their 10 RM, which they found the week before starting the study. And then there was five minutes break between each of these sets. So the variables measured were mean propulsive velocity of the barbell. We had counter movement jump height. So this was measured after each set and then once after each session. And then we had metabolic fatigue was measured uh, via lactate only. So they had their reasons for using only lactate. So we had seven sessions over four weeks, um, two per week, at least 48 to 72 hours between sessions. And finally, the last variable measured was the omni-res uh, kind of perceived index of fatigue. Uh, so this was measured from naught to one. Methods Gurf just talked about. Obviously, the results that came from the study are what we're really interested in. Um. And then we can kind of disregard their discussion because we'll discuss it on our own. But the results anyway fall into four different sections. Um, the first section is velocity. So this is the velocity of the barbell during every rep. The next section is counter movement jump. So both height and time, uh, flight time. We then have blood lactate, um, which is just a very simple test. And then the last one we have is perceived exertion. The results themselves are quite interesting uh, and there are some very good findings in it if you're looking to bring cluster training into your programming um, or into your athlete's programming. So cluster two and cluster three, so they're two different protocols. Uh, as Gurf kind of ran through, just to refresh your memory, cluster two is with 15 seconds rest in between each repetition and cluster three is with 30 seconds rest in between each repetition. Both of these showed significant uh, differences between the change in speed on each rep than we saw on the from the traditional sets. So basically, the speed of the repetitions towards the end of the set are significantly faster when we do cluster two or cluster three versions uh, when compared to the traditional versions, which would be no rest in between each rep. <clears throat> then to finish that bit off, there's no significant difference between cluster two and cluster three in terms of barbell velocity uh, on each of the reps. So it appears as though whether it's 15 seconds in between each repetition or 30 seconds in between each repetition, there may not be a huge difference. The next thing we're going to look at then is the counter movement jump. Um, and we'll start with counter movement jump height. So the value they looked at here is the loss in height on the jump. So your reduction in jump height. Um, as you might expect, the 
traditional one, which is three sets of 10 with no rest in between at your 10 rep max, showed a greater height loss than traditional two, which was six sets of five, um, and then cluster one. So there's no real surprises here. A set of 10 will fatigue you more uh, in terms of your counter movement jump than a set of five or a set where you're taking rest in between each rep. Then in results that mirror are kind of the initial thing we talked about velocity, we see cluster set two and cluster set three showing lesser height loss in a counter movement jump than cluster set four. Um, cluster set four is something we might have uh, heard about previously in this video. But what cluster set four was, was you're doing one set of 30 repetitions with 15 seconds rest in between each one. Uh, so that's a huge amount of time under tension. It's a huge set. So it's looking here that we have some sort of correlation between like the three sets of 10. Um, even though we have rest in between all 30 of the reps, it's still a huge amount of time under tension. And therefore we're seeing more height lost in the counter movement jump with cluster set four than we see with cluster set two and cluster set three. The next thing we look at then is blood lactate concentration level. So the amount of blood lactate uh, present in the blood, it's usually a simple finger prick test uh, and it shows us the amount of substrate usage and the amount of kind of fatigue that the muscle is currently under. These results mirror our, our previously stated results with the counter movement jump and with the bar velocity. So we see higher levels of blood lactate concentration in traditional one than we do in traditional two. We also see higher blood lactate levels in cluster one. So cluster one is a 10 second rest in between each repetition. That had a higher blood lactate concentration level than cluster set two, which is a 15 second rest in between each repetition. So we're kind of seeing that more rest in between each set may possibly alleviate some of that blood lactate. And then we see as cluster set four had higher concentration levels than cluster set three. And these are the significant differences, so statistically significant. Uh, so we're, all our kind of results are pushing us in the direction of cluster set two, or cluster set three being more effective at the moment for getting higher quality reps, maintaining bar speed, um, and then our technique being better over the course of a long set. The last thing then we're going to look at is our rate of perceived exertion or an RPE scale. Uh, the scale they're using here is an Omni Res. It's basically an RPE scale that's specifically for resistance training or resistance exercises. Uh, how these scales usually work is I would be, if I'm doing my set, so directly afterwards, somebody would hand me a scale. Uh, it's usually on a clipboard and I have to mark somewhere between one and 10. Uh, so one being no effort at all, 10 being very, very difficult. What we see here is traditional set one was found to have higher levels of rates of perceived exertion than cluster set four. Cluster set four was then found to have higher levels of uh, perceived exertion than traditional two, cluster set three, and cluster set two. So uh, cluster set two and three, again, are kind of coming out on top here. Um, we also see our traditional, so our six sets of five, uh, being shown to be kind of not that, or we wouldn't perceive the exertion as being that high. So just give you a few kind of pros and cons of the study, just to give you some context when we carry into the discussion. So probably some of the issues what i would have seen with this would be or would have been useful to see more of was lower reps so we saw all tens and we saw a few fives like for example in the traditional but we didn't see any cluster sets that did lower reps so we saw cluster sets at 10 and then one set at 30 so we saw three different very or three different protocols at like higher reps and then one up to very high reps at 30 reps which i suppose isn't at all practical but obviously it had its reasons for doing that um like we would have been interested in seeing something like say 10 by 2 or like 8 by 2 kind of lower reps especially in the cluster sets something like that or maybe not even twos but definitely somewhere as low as sixes for example something different where you've got like you can get really quality reps um 11 is quite small i suppose for a sample like this and i know they're looking at it's just quick observations but again 11 isn't enough to give very strong statistical data from it Lastly, so one session of each of these isn't really enough to infer anything for in actual practical training, especially when you're looking at something like mechanical fatigue and metabolic fatigue, like you have no idea that would repeated sessions of these 
uh, like workouts are never done in isolation in actual training and like that's what they're kind of looking at here uh, this is more of a suggest more things and more work needs to be done rather than this is what happens because i don't think you can really say that from this so it would be very interesting if people repeated each workout and s- kind of seen what results from the same participants then got when they did the second workout or even three or four times if at all possible because like creeping fatigue or like the total volume of that fatigue could vastly change results especially in like tough like neuromuscular control like so for like their counter movement jump or you know would you see different levels of blood lactate or would you've seen different like perceived efforts if they'd done like that one by 30 four or five weeks in a row so just some kind of maybe could have been better more useful but still overall a reasonable study yeah definitely to kind of mirror what garf is saying there um the first thing we need to look at is like that number 11. So like N equals to 11. 11 participants. How studies go about finding the numbers of participants. Like you might see 28 people or 32 people or 7,000 people in a different study. Uh, how you go about finding that is through a process called a power analysis. So um, it's basically an analysis you do to see how many people you need in your statistical analyses to give you sufficient power basically um so it tells you how valid your data is how kind of powerful that number is when we say something is statistically significant um so definitely agree with that that 11 isn't really enough you know um i think this study is very much along the lines of a study that's going to kind of open people's eyes and possibly open the door for more uh, research to be done in the area there's been a good bit of research done on cluster sets and the effectiveness of cluster sets. Um, but it is it is something that we need to see better, more rigid, more rigidly and more comprehensively designed studies uh, to be done in this in the future. Another kind of shortfall of this kind of study is, like, Gerf talked about there being no low-range reps, um, but there's also no variance in intensity. So me having intra rep rest will have huge, uh, like there'd be a huge degree of variance if that is at 60% of 1RM or 100% of 1RM. So obviously for somebody who's like a bodybuilder and doing a lot of hypertrophy work, uh, taking a break in between each of your 15 bicep curls mightn't make a huge difference or it may make a huge difference. But if you take the example of a a prop forward in rugby who's doing a set of six squats at 80% or six squats at 75% of their 1RM, that rest and that recuperation in between, so when you're still under tension but you're taking a small break, could hugely increase the quality of each of those repetitions. Um, And I think that's something that future studies should look into is the effectiveness of, of cluster sets across a broad range of intensities. Uh, and what I think you would see is that up towards the higher intensities, and particularly higher intensities when we have higher relative loading um, or higher relative volume loading, we'll see more of an effect in cluster sets. The last thing I would say then is like, to mirror what Gerf was saying, is like seven weeks doesn't give you enough time to really find anything out. Um, like we like seeing... 8 to 12 week studies with resistance training you'll know yourself how long it takes to actually elicit a response this obviously isn't an intervention study but just to get people used to the kind of the process of like standing with a barbell on your back even though this was using a smith machine um so an apparatus to kind of steady you in your squat standing there with the weight on your back and taking those breaks and becoming efficient at taking breaks um, and recovering in between each repetition is a skill in itself. Like, we've seen the variance of experienced in resistance training across studies. Um, people need to learn the skill of the actual cluster set itself. So that might be something that in future studies, they have a bit of a, a kind of onboarding process whereby people learn it. They don't just have this kind of just barely getting in touch with the cluster sets and how they work so i think that is a big thing to look at moving forward is that we'll have some sort of learning effect happening when people are are starting to do these cluster sets and maybe we might need to prolong our studies then by a month or two months more um and see what the long-term effect of cluster sets is like with skilled participant
So the primary concern for who these cluster sets might be useful for, I think, is someone who is worried about maintaining peak power output all the time. So someone who needs to be powerful as much as possible. Like, so if you have a general strength trainer in the gym who's the squat, bench, deadlifting, or your hypertrophy, it doesn't really matter if your ability to express power is that high or if you're losing or gaining it as long as you're gaining your muscle, it doesn't really matter. Whereas if we have someone like a, a sprinter or track and field, rugby, pitch player, like anyone who needs to be fast in their movements, which is the vast majority of sports, you want to stay powerful or keep, and you want to train that ability all the time. So specificity comes into play, and we have seen like in, in other studies where like even fiber type can change after a single workout. So over a period of time, if you're spending the vast majority of your off-season training or your in-gym training sessions as... Um, kind of training yourself to be slower so we saw in this that the counter movement jump reduced less in the cluster sets i think in cl2 and cl3 so if you're an athlete it may be that if you use cluster sets you may reduce your kind of loss in power you may lose the kind of uh that drag that high rep sets may take from you or like kind of higher volume sets may take away from your power so it may reduce this and still give you good volume in terms of uh kind of metabolic stress and kind of hypertrophy adaption in terms of what exercises to use, I would probably stay away from back squats. Back squats are actually the last exercise I would probably pick for this. So something like block power cleans, for example, where you did something like six by two or ten by two, or sorry, something like say six by four or something like that in singles or doubles. Uh, or you could use this in existence exercises a little bit like barbell row or dumbbell rows, barbell rows, something like that. Uh, Dallas would be a great one for this. Something that's not particularly fatiguing, where when you're resting between the reps, you're not heavily loading your spine so like something like the um the the barbell back squat is probably the least one you want in this so if you're particularly adept at training and if you're a talented athlete chances are your back squat is quite high so it's multiple times your body weight it might be two maybe say for the working sets of maybe twice your body weight or more so holding that weight for that period of time i would almost certainly imagine over a period of time would lead to more stress so doing this for five six weeks so if you laid out a kind of a proper program for a couple of weeks and using these cluster sets for higher reps I would almost certainly imagine that it would produce extra fatigue. So if we look at something like the CNS fatigue, uh, lighter loads over a longer period of time and choose more CNS fatigue. So the possibility that holding that weight on your back is a similar form of loading. So is that making you more fatigue? And I would, would imagine it probably is. So something like a deadlift where you're not holding the weights and you can rest, you can reset psychologically. You are not distracted by holding that weight. So you can think about the next rep and then try and move it as fast as possible. So which is if you're what you're going for, if you are an athlete, like you're trying to, be as fast as possible. You're trying to pull that bar as fast as possible in the deadlift or the uh, block power clean or whatever it is you choose to do. Then on to practical applications. Um, and practical applications are what this video series is really about. Like, very few people here are watching pay-per-view videos to try and get better at, at scientific study design. Uh, I think there definitely are some practical implications here, right? So a huge amount of our audience are weightlifters or strength training athletes who are dealing with weights every day and that is part of their sport is moving a barbell around because that is then part of your sport you're constantly thinking about the sets you're doing and how to make the reps and every single thing you do with a barbell as good as possible uh quality then becomes paramount and i think what we've kind of demon or what this study has demonstrated and we've kind of spoke about how it demonstrates it uh is that clusters could possibly improve the quality. So if it's something like a change to your technique you're doing with a your back squat if you're a powerlifter or with your snatch if you're a weightlifter or whatever that may be, maybe clusters are a good way to get really high quality reps in with that now altered technique. The other time cluster sets can be really useful if you're in that strength training group is if you're coming back from a, a deload or a period of time off and the reps might not be as sharp or as snappy or they might just not have that good feeling that everybody kind of recognizes when the barbell is moving well uh, and that we it, that kind of often goes away after a period of not training. So I think in the case where you're altering technique and making trying to make the quality of your repetitions as good as possible, or maybe if you're coming back from an injury or some time off and you don't have that good feeling with weights, then the cluster sets become something that might be more applicable to you. The second group then is the group of athletes who their sport doesn't revolve around moving a weight around. 
it doesn't revolve around the gym um, or kind of one rep max attempts or anything like that. So field athletes, uh, track and field, all this this huge group of people, fighters, who are looking to make the most of their time in the gym. So they're looking for something that's uh, time effective. It's not going to fatigue them hugely afterwards. And that's going to give them the most bang for their buck in terms of you don't have to do loads of exercises. The cluster set then might be a good option, right? Uh, and to take a quote from the study itself, the primary effect of cluster set configurations is to reduce the fatigue when compared to traditional set configurations based on continuous reps. Previous studies have shown that, that cluster set configurations may increase both quality and the volume of resistance training exercises while reducing perceived exertion. So when we look at that second group, this is a group of people who just need to get the effect from training and not be too fatigued when they go on to their sports-specific stuff. Cluster training then suddenly kind of rears its head as possibly a very, very good tool. You're not beating people up too much. You're getting more effective training volume in. Um, so really, this study kind of just opens our eyes as to is this something we should be bringing into kind of professional SNC environments or specific SNC environments where we need a training effect and we don't want people to get too beat up. That concludes our paper review for this week. As always, we hope you got some value from it. We hope you learned something from it and hopefully it might have like kind of opened your eyes to a slightly different way of training. Uh, if you have something that you'd like to see reviewed, so if there's a paper you've seen online, if there's a paper you're involved with writing uh, and you'd like to see us review it, please just pop it into the comments or send us an email to seekastrength at gmail.com and we'll see you next week.